Hello everyone, my name is Bogdan Kiva and in this talk I'm going to present results from the joint paper with my advisor Laszlo Babai titled Matrix Rigidity Depends on the Target Field. This talk consists of three parts. In the first part I would discuss the definition of matrix rigidity and effect of the field on this definition. In the second part I would briefly mention recent non-rigidity results and co corollaries we, we obtain. And in the third part, I would um, briefly discuss key ideas behind our main result. Matrix rigidity was introduced by Valiant in his seminal 1977 paper, where for a matrix A and target rank R, he defined rigidity to be the smallest number of entries that needs to be changed to get a matrix of rank at most one. We would use capital R, to denote rigidity of matrix A for uh, target rank. Um, consider the example below, matrix on the left has um, rank five and in order to get a matrix of rank two, one need to change at least three entries in this matrix. Moreover, three entries suffices, namely if we change five, three and two to one, one and one, we would get a matrix of rank two. So we can write that rigidity of this matrix for target rank two is three. Matrix rigidity was introduced as a tool to prove circuit complexity um, lower bounds. And to discuss this connection, um, we say that a family of matrices uh, of unbounded order N is highly rigid if there exists a positive constant epsilon such that for any N by N matrix in this family, in order to uh, get a matrix of rank at most N over 100, one needs to change at least n to the one plus epsilon entries of this matrix for any sufficiently large n. Then Valiant proved that uh, linear functions defined by highly rigid matrices cannot be computed by arithmetic circuits of linear size and logarithmic depth. This means that explicit family of highly rigid matrices would show circuit complexity lower bounds. Moreover, as Boro um, showed in uh, 1989 that um, this notion of rigidity can be used to separate polynomial hierarchy from uh, p-space in communication complexity. Again, one needs uh, explicit families of some rigid families of some rigid matrices. Um, also, note that explicitness is important here because, as Valiant show, um, over any infinite field for almost all matrices rigidity achieves its maximum possible value n minus r square. And here almost all means that uh, this is satisfied for non-empty the risky open set of matrices. So in particular, uh, this is much more than we require for uh, highly rigid matrices because right-hand side um, is quadratic here. And this is tight because uh, there is a trivial upper bound for rigidity. Note that the definition I gave on the first slide does not take into account the effect of the field. And naturally, there are two fields involved in this definition. The first field um, is the field over which matrix A is defined, and smaller si such field we would call field of definition. And the second field is a possibly an extension field of the first field over which we allow to make changes uh, to the matrix. And we call such field target field. Then um, more precise definition of rigidity, which takes into account uh, effect of the field would be the following. So let K be a field uh, over which matrix A is defined. Let L be a target field, some field extension of K. Then we can define rigidity of A over field extension L for target rank R to be the smallest number of entries we need to make uh, in, in matrix A uh, to values from uh, field extension L in order to get a matrix of rank at most R. So for instance, in theory of computing, we are um, interested in zero one matrices and we can view zero one matrices as matrices over finite field or over uh, infinite field, say fields of characteristic zero. Then if you treat this matrix as a, a matrix with complex entries, um, we can say that field of definition for this matrix will, would be rational numbers, and we can make changes to this matrix from some field extension of rational numbers, say um, from reals. 
Then the question we study in this paper is, does rigidity really depend on the uh, target field L? So is it just a formal um, a formality or is there some non-trivial dependence on, on, on this field extension L? And um, we argue that this is a natural question to ask because it's plausible that um, allowing changes from larger field may decrease rigidity. And the second motivation for this question comes from recent non-rigidity results by Alman Williams, Dwir Edelman, and Dwir Liu. In the first two papers, authors used the same field over which matrix was defined to show non-rigidity results. And in the last paper, Dwir and Liu used actually a field extension to establish um, rigidity upper bounds. More specifically, for the class of circulant matrices, um, which are matrices in which every row is obtained just by cyclic shift of the first row. Dwir and Liu proved that circulants with rational entries are not highly rigid over uh, complex numbers. And an open question is whether circulants with rational entries are highly rigid over uh, rational numbers. We argue that there are two especially natural regimes to, to, to study rigidity, strict rigidity. In this regime, we allow only changes from the field of definition of a matrix. Um, and another regime is absolute rigidity. In, in this regime, we do not restrict our, uh, the field from which we, uh, we make changes in any possible way. So we allow arbitrarily uh, changes to, to the matrix from arbitrary field extension. Then we can similarly uh, define notions of strictly highly rigid matrices and absolutely highly rigid matrices. And it's easy to see that uh, since strict rigidity is a more restrictive setup, uh, then strict rigidity is at least an absolute rigidity. And this means that a uh, family of absolutely highly rigid matrices is strictly highly rigid. Then, um, in the paper, we actually show that um, for a given matrix, absolute rigidity is always achieved over some finite field extension. And moreover, uh, for any matrix, absolute rigidity is achieved for uh, algebraic closure of the field of definition. The main result of our papers gives a multiplicative gap of three halves minus little o of one between strict rigidity and absolute rigidity. More precisely, we show that for any field of characteristic zero and any degree two extension of this field, um, for the rest of this talk, you can think of K as being uh, rational numbers and L as being rational numbers with square root of two. So for these fields, there exists a two R times two R matrix A two R over smaller field K, such that its rigidity for target rank R over, um, field of definition K is at least three R minus two, while its rigidity over field extension L is at most two R. In fact, we conjecture that much larger separations should be true. We conjecture that there exists a family of uh, matrices of arbitrary la large size with rational entries such that um, for any N by N matrix in this family, um, its rigidity for target rank n over two over rational numbers is at least n to the one plus epsilon, while its rigidity for target rank n over two over complex numbers is linear in n. This would mean that there exists a family of highly rigid matrices over rational numbers, which is not highly rigid over complex numbers. And we believe that this statement should be true even when complex numbers um, are replaced by a uh, field of rational numbers, uh, say this. Uh, square root of two or any other degree two extension of, uh, of rational numbers. Moreover, um, this separation between strict and um, absolute rigidity raises the following question for circuits. Is it possible that there exists a family of square matrices such that corresponding linear functions can be computed by logarithmic depths linear size circuits over complex numbers, but not over rational numbers? Now let me briefly discuss uh, some recent non-rigidity results and uh, 
our results uh, as well. So um, after rigidity was introduced by Leslie Valent in uh, 1977, uh, several families of candidates were proposed as candidates for uh, explicit rigid families. Um, for example, Hadamard matrices were proposed by Pudlak, Savitsky, Rasborov, and Allen, and those are plus one, minus one matrices whose rows are orthogonal. Um, there are two especially well-studied subclasses called Walsh-Hadamard matrices, which are just Kronecker products of uh, specific small matrix 1, 1, 1, minus 1. Um, another very well-studied family of Hadamard matrices is Paley-Hadamard matrices, defined by Paley. And this family is exponentially more frequent than walsh hadamard matrices. Circulants were proposed as candidate for high rigidity by Cadenotti, Pudlak, and Resta. And three families were proposed by Valiant. Um, the first family is family of Van der Mond matrices. Those are matrices in which columns are defined by powers um, of some generators, A1, A2, A3, dot, dot AN. Um, Discrete Fourier transform matrices over complex numbers. Those are a special case of Van der Mond matrices where generators are just powers of primitive nth root of unity. And incidence matrices of projective planes over finite fields. Um, when they considered uh, for rigidity over F2. So it turned out that almost all of these families are not highly rigid. So the first family shown to be not highly rigid are walsh hadamard matrices defined over rational numbers. And it was proven to be not strictly highly rigid by Alman and Williams in stock 2017. The same family of walsh hadamard uh, matrices was shown to be not strictly rigid over finite fields by Dvir and Edelman in 2019. Circulants and discrete Fourier transforms um, were shown to be not highly rigid by Dvir and Liu in 2019. And in contrast to previous two results, Dvir and Liu um, require field extension. So they do not prove strict rigidity. They only prove absolute rigidity of circulants and discrete Fourier transform matrices. And using results of Dvir and Liu, in this paper, we show that uh, paley hadamard matrices, uh, Van der Mond matrices whose generators form geometric progressions, and incidence matrices of projective planes over finite fields are not highly rigid. This still leaves open a question whether families which are not absolutely rigid are strictly rigid. In particular, are rational circulants highly rigid uh, over rational numbers? And we know that they are not rigid over field of complex numbers, as shown by Dvir and Liu. Also, we are still don't know whether van der Mond matrices are highly rigid. And it would be nice to come up with some other candidates for high rigidity. Um, actually, more families of matrices were shown to be not highly rigid very recently. In particular, Josh Allman in Stock 2021 proved that for a fixed size D, if you consider a Kronecker products of matrices of size D by D, then they are not highly rigid. And he proved the inequality of the form that um, in order to get a matrix of rank n to the one minus gamma, it's sufficient to change less than n to the one plus, plus epsilon entries for any epsilon, where gamma is essentially uh, d over uh, due to the d. We know that um, even though this bound is much stronger than we need for uh, to prove uh, that matrix is not highly rigid, this bound is not sufficient to prove similar results when we consider Kronecker products of matrices of non-equal sets. So um, this result was further improved by Kiva, um, where this constant gamma was improved from exponential dependence in D to essentially linear dependence for matrices of equal size. And because of this better bound, um, using different technique, this uh, this result was further generalized to matrices of, uh, of just bounded order, not necessarily equal order, with uh, slightly worse uh, dependence of gamma on D. And uh, this gen generalization to matrices of non-equal size um, is motivated as a 
step towards proving that all known Hadamard matrices are not highly rigid over complex numbers. So um, I will just briefly remind that Kronecker products of Hadamard matrices are Hadamard. So it means that um, one cannot get a highly rigid Hadamard matrices by taking Kronecker products of, say, Walsh Hadamard matrices, Paley Hadamard matrices, and some small examples, uh, let's say, known 16 by 16 or 20 by 20 examples. So um, this sort of shows that by considering uh, Kronecker products of small matrices, we cannot get highly rigid Hadamard matrices. Finally, let me briefly discuss uh, the key ideas behind our main result. Um, so recall that in our main result, we show that um, for any field of characteristic zero K and any degree to, to extension of this field, there exists a sequence of two R by two R matrices such that its rigidity over K for target, uh, ta target rank R is at least three R minus two, and its rigidity over field extension for target rank R is at most two R. So first we would like to argue that um, Trivial upper bound on rigidity gives an obstacle for a simple counting proof uh, for statement of this flavor. So um, note that any n by n matrix A for target rank R has rigidity at most n minus R squared. This is because if matrix A already has rank less than R, no changes are needed. Um, otherwise, there exists a minor. Um, R by R minor, which is non-singular, and we can assume that this is top left minor, and then by changing entries in the uh, bottom right, N minus R by N minus R matrix, we can get a matrix of rank R. And Valiant showed that almost all matrices over infinite field achieve this trivial upper bound. And this gives an obstacle for a simple counting separation between rigidities over different fields. Indeed, um, in order to show such a separation for some t, we need to prove that rigidity over field extension L is at most t, and rigidity over um, subfield K is strictly larger than t. Since rigidity is always upper bounded by n minus r square, this lower bound implies that t is at most n minus r square. Um, is strictly less than n minus r square. And this means that we want rigidity over field extension L to be strictly less than n minus r square. And we know that this bound is not satisfied by almost all matrices. So it means that if we want to show such separation, we need first to construct matrix A in some special way. So to do this, we would follow the following high level strategy. So we would start with a matrix of rank R which has only a small number of entries not in the field K, let's say T entries. Then by changing these T entries not in K to entries in K, we um, can get a matrix A such that rigidity over L for target rank R is at most T. We can just undo these changes and get a matrix of rank R. And then all we need to do is to show that for some matrix of such form, over field K, its rigidity um, for target rank R is strictly greater than T. Note that this third step requires some lower bound technique for matrix rigidity and very few such techniques are available. So let us elaborate a little bit more on uh, how we would construct matrix M of small rank R and only few entries not in the field K. So because we want a matrix of rank R, um, such matrix can always be written as a product of X times Y, where X is a matrix of size N times R and Y is a matrix of, of size R times N. Then every entry of M can be computed as a dot product of row of matrix X and column of matrix Y. And by considering a degree two extension field defined by some element omega, not in the field K such that omega square is in K, um, we can write this row and column as a linear combination of uh, vector in K plus omega times vector in K and similarly for Y. 
then the condition that M3 Mij is in K is equivalent to saying that the following uh, sum of two dot products is just zero. This means that if we fix a matrix X, we get N square minus T linear constraints for um, two times R times N variables in Y. And we would consider a special regime in which we would allow entries uh, to be not in the field K only on the diagonal of a matrix. So we would consider a matrix of size 2R by 2R, and we would look for matrices of rank R, which can be written in the form B plus omega times identity, where B is a matrix in, in field K. Note that um, for matrix M of such form, since it has rank R, um, for if it can be written as a product of X times Y, and for fixed X, um, this pattern of entries not in K impose two R linear constraints for every column of Y, which has two R variables in K. So it means that for almost all matrices X, the system would, would be non-degenerate. And so there would exist a unique solution uh, for Y. And this means that the set of all such matrices satisfies nice properties. In, in particular, this would imply that um, there is no algebraic dependence between entries of uh, say first two R columns of matrix M, while all other entries algebraically depend on these uh, entries of first two uh, of first R columns. I'm sorry, um, and this is true for any subset of R columns. Then on the first step, we just take this matrix constructed on the previous step and change diagonal entries not in K to some entries in K, arbitrary ones, and no matter how we make this change, we would always have a matrix A. Uh, for which rigidity is at most 2R. Just undo these changes on the diagram. Then all we need to do is prove a, a, a lower bound for uh, matrix A of such form. And in fact, we show that almost all matrices of such forms sat satisfy this lower bound. So um, the way to, to, to do this, we want to show that for every location, every mask of 3R minus 3 changes, they exclude only a small set of constructed matrices A. And um, yeah, so we can uh, illustrate this with this example here. So we start with some matrix B, then we change diagonal entries D, and then we have some pattern of uh, 3R minus 3 changes, which adversary can change to get a matrix of rank R. And we want to show that in this way, he can succeed only for a small set of matrices. A. Then as long as finite union of small sets is still small, we would be good. So um, our proof consists of two ingredients. The first ingredient would restrict the possible mass of changes. And the second ingredient would analyze um, every fixed uh, mask of changes. So the first ingredient is so-called untouched minor argument which says that if there is a minor of size R plus one times R plus one, which is non-singular, then in order to reduce rank of entire matrix to R, we need to change at least one entry in this minor. And this clearly restricts the possible masks of, 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 of changes. However, note that this argument does not distinguish field. So it's not sensitive uh, to field. And hence, this argument alone alone cannot succeed to show separation of rigidities for different fields. The second, arg um, yeah, so um, the conclusion we, we would use from this first argument is that, uh, first ingredient, is that there exists a set of R plus two columns is at most one element change in every column. Plus we would show some other structural properties of uh, mask of changes. The second ingredient we need is elementary algebraic uh, ge al algebraic geometry arguments over not algebraically closed field. And the central concept uh, for us will be the risky topology. So let me briefly uh, recall that closed sets in the risky topology are just the common zero sets uh, for a set of polynomials. And we refer to such sets as the risky closed. 
Um, an example is matrices of rank at most R. This set is the risky closed because it can be um, described with polynomial conditions that determinant of every R plus one times R plus one submatrix is zero, which is clearly a polynomial constraint. Um, we would also need the notion of algebraic set, which is just as a risky closed set in the affine space K to the M. And we would say that irreducible algebraic set uh, that the algebraic set is irreducible if it's not a union of two proper Zariski closed sets. Uh, for instance, uh, affine space k to the n is, is irreducible. Then recall that we want to say that for every fixed mask of 3r minus 3 changes, this mask doesn't work for a large set of matrices a. And what we need, we need an intersection of finitely many large set is large. And the way to capture this is to show that um, is to, to define large as being non-empty the risky open set in al uh, irreducible algebraic set. Then we can define smallest complement to large and notion of almost all as being a member of a large set. Um, so we show that um, the family of matrices we consider form um, an irreducible algebraic set. So we can perform arguments of such, uh, of such type. And using um, untouched minor argument, we, we can focus on R plus two columns where at most one element in, is changed in every column. Moreover, uh, we can use untouched minor argument to show that rows and columns of, uh, of this uh, matrix can, can, can be permuted in such a way that changes in the first R columns happen on the diagonal. Then, Considering this block matrix and subdivided into a, an R by R block, R by R block, and two uh, and four vectors of length R, we can say that the fact that this matrix should have rank R impose the following two R polynomial constraints. So if we um, consider like um, this constraint for every row, we would get precisely two R polynomial constraints. And in these constraints, we have freedom to choose R plus two diagonal entries in the construction of A in arbitrary way, and adversary can change his R plus two entries to get uh, a matrix of rank R. Um, and note that over field L, adversary can always succeed uh, by changing R plus two entries so that this system of, of uh, polynomial equation would always be satisfied. He, he can always undo the diagonal changes we did to go back to the original rank R matrix. Um, however, we show that over field K, he cannot succeed. And in order to do that, we first show that um, in the original construction of this matrix, there is no algebraic dependence between uh, entries of matrices N1 and A2. And we show that if this system of two R polynomial constraints is satisfied, then no matter what, what changes from field K adversary make, there would be some like if the system is satisfied, then there is some algebraic dependence between entries of A1 and A2. And this precisely means that um, the set of such matrices in one and A2 is a small set. And this is sufficient to show our lower bound. Um, note that the matrices constructed in such form are not explicit. And we give just one example of explicit uh, matrix where rigidity over field of definition is not the same as rigidity over its extension. So consider the product of the following five by two and two by five matrices. We would get a matrix of rank two, which has eight irrational entries. We can change them to um, random rational entries. And then we used computer search to verify that for this specific matrix A, there are no other eight changes, um, even over the field of complex numbers, which can reduce rank to two. And if we change this red entries, then only the above matrix and its conjugate are of rank two. So it means in particular that this matrix A require at least nine rational changes to get rank two, while eight entries over Q square root two would be sufficient. Finally, let me uh, mention some open problems. So the first open problem asks whether there exists a circle length with rational entries which are, not high, which are highly rigid over rationals. We know that um, they cannot be highly rigid over complex numbers by Dvir and Liu. Uh, we also ask whether there exists a highly rigid Vandermonde matrices over complex numbers. 
Um, we proved that absolute rigidity is achieved over finite field extension, but can we prove some effective bounds on the degree of this extension? And another problem would be to come up with explicit example of matrices which, so, which show separation uh, for rigidity over Q and say some degree to extension of Q. And the most interesting two problems is to come up with an example um, of matrices which show much stronger separation between rigidity over Q and rigidity over C. So in particular, it would be interesting to come up. We conjecture that there exists a family of rational matrices for which um, rigidity for target rank n over two over rational numbers is at least n to the one plus epsilon and over complex numbers is at most linear. And another interesting question is whether there exists a family of matrices, which is much easier to compute over complex numbers and over rational numbers. Uh, more precisely, does there exist a family of square matrices with rational entries such that um, corresponding linear functions can be computed by logarithmic depth linear size circuits over complex numbers, but not over rational numbers? That's all I wanted to discuss in this talk. Thank you for listening.